the number of, in fact, of Jones and Smith were all over the map. They were in a half a dozen different religious groups uh, during the course of their lifetime, but all of them with the focus on let's get back to the Bible, let's, go, let's do what the Bible says. And so then I think maybe the third lesson I did was um, one that I had originally done while I was still teaching at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Methodist Church uh, down there said, uh, would you come and talk to us about uh, churches of Christ? They were doing a series of, you know, what does this church believe or that church something. And so they knew that I taught this uh, history of religion course at UK. So they said, would you come out and do this? So, so I told you what I told them, which is basically uh, more about how John Wesley and O'Kelly and some of those in the Methodist background uh, came out. And then I know I did a lesson on the, the new hymnal that would have been in 2012 because that's when it came out and this was shortly after that. And I know I've done a, a lesson on instrumental music here. The ones that I've kept track of once we got sort of into this track, um, and by the way, Bill, this doesn't include the two that we did on uh, uh, archaeology and the Oriental Institute, and then we went one day, actually met at the OI and went through the, uh, the museum there. But um, we, we continued this series in 2013, and I've got dates and so forth on most of these. And then uh, in 14, I know we talked about um, some of the unity movements earlier this century. Uh, Daniel Sommer and Fred Kirshner down in Indianapolis. Kirshner was this prominent uh, disciple, uh, minister involved with the Butler School of Religion. Uh, Daniel Sommer was a prominent uh, preacher who had a kind of a following in the northern tier of states that was different from the David Lipscomb, Austin McGarry, what some people have called the Texas-Tennessee axis. We had a lot of southern churches, uh, many of whom had been uh, slaveholders or in the slave economy before the Civil War. Uh, Sommer was very much different from that. He was... Uh, his parents were German immigrants. He lived most of his life in either Ohio, most of it actually in Indiana, and preached for uh, the old North Indianapolis church, um, which became Emerson Avenue when uh, I-65 construction took their old building uh, back in the late 1950s. And that's the church that I grew up in, actually. I sat on a pew right near Bessie Sommer, who was Daniel's daughter, and edited the paper, did the office work on the American Christian Review. So we talked a little bit about those kinds of um, efforts to um, unify people who, in the movement who had been uh, differing over instrumental music and the Missionary Society and so forth, and Sommer finally became convinced that that wasn't going to work. And so he started to concentrate on what, what can we do together among those who, as he put it, have kept the worship pure, that is, didn't introduce instrumental music. And one of the big issues that we're going to talk a little bit more about this morning was um, what kind of institutions can, if any, can the church support? Uh, Sommer was widely known for being opposed to Bible colleges, um, certainly for them taking money from the treasury and being supported as an adjunct to the church, as a kind of a handmaiden to the church. A lot of people have the idea without a Bible college, where would we get our preachers? We can't train preachers. We just got to have these Bible colleges. Uh, well, Sommer was adamantly opposed to that. Late in life, when he made a tour of the southern states, a couple of them actually, and actually did what people who differ ought to do, which is what? what you tell me. What people, brethren, have differences with each other? What, what's one main thing they ought to do? I'm sorry? Discussion. Absolutely. They ought to sit with each other face to face and talk about what are our differences and is there any way to resolve that. And what, what happens when you do that is there's less misrepresentation. I mean, a fundamental rule of settling controversy, whether it's uh, confrontation in business or academia or whatever is, if you can't fairly state what the guy on the other side or the woman on the other side of the table believes so that they could at least recognize that as a first cousin to what they actually think, then you can't get anywhere. Because what often happens is we wind up uh, intentionally or unintentionally misrepresenting what the other person believes, which says we don't really understand what they believe or worst case scenario, we understand it, but we're going to deliberately make it look as bad as we can by misrepresenting. So anyway, that's what Sommer uh, began to try to do. And then we talked uh, last year about uh, some of the developments that brought us up into the 20th century 
and uh, you very graciously let me do my thing on uh, changes in preaching and even come back and repeat it because we didn't get it recorded, I think, the first time was, was the deal. So that, that's kind of where we've been. Um, just to recap, what do we mean by a restoration movement? Well, what I mean by that is a movement to unite Christians. This was a, a, un, a unity movement, and sometimes that has a, a bad connotation. People talk about unity as though it's something that's not a good idea. I think because there have been people and movements in the past to try to unite on something that's not truly biblical. But how important is unity? Uh, what, what was on the Lord's mind and his lips in John 17, the last hours that he was on earth, that they may all be one, uh, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I mean, we compromise our, um, our, our approach to the world, our, our witness, if you will, our, our presentation to the world by, uh, by being in a state of, of disharmony and disunion. And that's true generally, but I, I'll tell you, the number of small towns in the United States of America where the Church of Christ is known not for preaching the truth, not for loving each other, they're known to just squabble and nitpick and fuss and fight uh, and that, that's just the reputation, to just be honest about it, um, deserved or not, and in a lot of cases it's deserved. So it was a movement to unite Christians by abandoning denominationalism, leaving creeds and doctrines of men and saying, why should we be divided over something the Bible does not say rather than uniting on things the Bible clearly teaches? In other words, by restoring New Testament Christianity. So restoring New Testament Christianity was a goal, but in another sense, it was the means to an end. It was the means to get to unity. If we'll all just go by the Bible, the idea was and is, then we ought to be able to unite on that rather than being divided over all these creeds. Now, I recommended a couple of things. I think last time I brought it's that doorstop book that's down there under my iPad, if you want to look at it, but it's this encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell movement, and it's got articles by people all over the place. I've got six or eight, I think, in there uh, that deal with people like I did the one on Daniel Summer, uh, I think I did the one on Kirshner, did the one on Roy Cogdell, on Homer Haley, on a number of other people whose bios are there, uh, did some of the institutional uh, articles as well. But for the thing we're going to talk about today, I would recommend, if you're interested, a little book called The Simple Pattern which uh, actually incorporates a, a smaller pamphlet that I did years ago that's now out of print, the history and background of the institutional controversy. I want to talk this morning about what's the nature of the church, and uh, I'm already overheated, so I'm going to take my coat off and be a little bit more informal, if I can. Um, and so what I did when this went out of print, there, this is the only copy I have left of this, actually, is uh, I rewrote it for something that uh, Jim Deason uh, does every year. He calls it uh, Exploring Current Issues Conference, and he invites a number of younger preachers uh, to come and uh, listen to a number of us who are a little older talk about some things that we think are important. So uh, in this particular year, which is 2011, I believe, or 2012 maybe, I think we did it in 11 and published this in 12, but I, I did the history chapter. So if you want to know what happened in the 20th century, there's 40 pages of that in here. And then some other people that uh, spoke and contributed chapters, Paul Earnhardt, uh, L.A. Stouffer, uh, Bill Hall, Carol Sutton, and Dan King. So you got a pretty wide spectrum of different guys, uh, some a little older than some of the rest of it, but I'll leave this up here if somebody wants to look at it. But that's a resource if you want more information about some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Now, if we look at biblical text on unity, I ask the question, how important is it? Well, the psalmist says it's good and pleasant and uses all kinds of metaphors and analogies, like precious ointment. It's like the dew of Hermon ascending from the highest mountain uh, north of Israel. For the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And that's not just something from the Psalms. As I said earlier, Jesus' prayer in John 17 is that we might all be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, with that as a baseline, the New Testament also recognizes the fact of division and the fact that it would occur from our perspective that it has occurred. Uh, I've tried to say to people who want to know what, 
why, why we should study church history is because it's a living laboratory of what the Bible said would happen, did happen. Uh, scripture predicts this. It talks about the fact that people would fall away from the faith. And it tells us here that when you come together, I hear that there be divisions, that there are divisions among you. And Paul says, I partly believe it. I, I'm, I'll go Paul one better and say, I, I entirely believe it. I wholly believe it. For there must also be heresies, divisions among you. In order that, there's a, there's a silver lining in this cloud. One of the things that that does is that they which are approved may be made manifest. Those who are following the Lord. One thing division will do is it will make it crystal clear who is following the truth, who wants the truth, and who doesn't. And uh, I've used the illustration before, but I'll say it again. Um, I'm going to talk about this debate later. My dad, who uh, passed away last year on March the 20th at age 93, um, took me to the Holt Toddy debate in Indianapolis, uh, 1954. I would have been five years old. And I insist that that constitutes cruel and unusual punishment for a five-year-old to take him to a religious debate. But evidently they couldn't get a babysitter and mom was doing something. But anyway, but my dad said he was a young man in his early 30s at the time. And he said, you know, you go to these debates and you'd hear one guy get up and you say, well, you know, that sounds reasonable. And then the next guy get up and you say, well, you know, that sounds pretty good to me. And he hadn't made up his mind about this. But he said after several nights, by the end of the debate, he said it became pretty clear who was really trying to search for what saith the scripture and who was just trying to defend a position. I mean, he said it, it became pretty evident after a while. And I think that's what this text is saying, that those would be made manifest, would be made obvious, who are trying to serve the Lord. And we look at other texts like 1 John 2 and verse 19, where the apostle says, they, somebody, went out from us, and if you look at the pronouns in 1 John, the us here are the apostles. What John says, what we saw, what our hands handled, what we observed, what we heard concerning the word of life, we proclaim to you back in the first chapter. And so in the second chapter, they went out from us. Well, who's the they? They were not of us. If they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. They are not a part of the apostolic body. They are not listening to the apostolic preaching of the cross. They are not following the teaching of Jesus' apostles that he sent in his stead. And John says that is obvious when you have a division. Who is following what the Bible says? Who's following the apostolic message? And who's doing something else? And the division, as tragic as it is, uh, will certainly do that. Well, all right, so here we are. Um, you get into the 20th century, and you've got this division that occurred actually in the late 19th century over the missionary society, over the instrument. Um, the instrument's the most obvious thing because you can hear it. It became a kind of a focal point or oral point, I guess you'd say, of division. Uh, but in my mind, as I've said before, the missionary society, the perversion of the organization of the church, which we'll talk about a little bit later, to me that's, that's the thing that makes a lot of these divisions the same. Going all the way back to the Roman Catholic Church, including the institutional controversy, well, if we don't understand the nature of the church, the structure of the church, how it's organized, uh, then we're going to continue to make the same mistake. But these folks in the Christian church uh, actually also divided. They started the 20th century uh, united around things like the Missionary Society and the instrument, and then they began to divide so that by 1926, by the first quarter of the 20th century, you had the development of the North American Christian Convention. A, a minority of these churches pulled off. They're more conservative. They objected to a lot of the liberalism that was being taught, for example, at the Disciples Divinity House over at the University of Chicago or the Disciples Divinity House at Vanderbilt or other places where um, um, some of their ministers were being trained in a very modernistic kind of way. And so these independent Christian churches, which didn't like what was being taught by the Missionary Society, pulled off and, and started their own conventions, started their own organizations, started their own colleges. They're actually technically and legally known as the Undenominational Fellowship of Christian Churches and Churches of Christ which tells us a lot about it. They, they, uh, they're, they're saying, what, what, what would that title say to you? What are they at least saying they are? 
We're not a denomination. Whereas the disciples are proudly saying, we are a denomination. We've, we've reorganized. We, go, we went through restructure in 1968. They uh, completed it. They'd been at, at it for several decades. But they restructured and put their headquarters in Indianapolis, where a lot of their agencies and seminary and retirement uh, pension fund and so forth already were. Uh, and they said, we are a denomination. We look like a denomination. We talk like a denomination. We think like a denomination. Let's quit this business if we're not a denomination to be honest about it and say, we're a denomination. And that's exactly what they are. They wanted to get involved in the ecumenical movement, and they did and are involved insofar as those talks are still going on. Uh, but this undenominational fellowship is a way of saying we're, we're not a denomination, but we are a, a religious group. We're, we're a fellowship, and we call ourselves what? Christ yeah, Christian churches and churches of Christ. You ever travel, especially across the Midwest, and you go and you're on vacation, you drive into a town in Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, Indiana, and there's a sign that says Church of Christ, and you don't, I mean, I've had this experience several times traveling when, when I was a kid. We'd go into a church, and my dad would spy out the piano or an organ, or 180 right in the middle of the aisle, and out we'd go. It didn't matter who was looking at us or wondering, what are these heathen doing in here? My dad's, we're not worshiping there, because he grew up in the Christian church. And uh, as he said to one fellow when we were in a religious discussion, the guy said, well, you don't, you don't really know what I believe. And my dad said, I grew up in that. I know what you believe. <laughs> and so um, the, the idea is it's a kind of a halfway house. We, we accept the instrument. We think it's okay to have a missionary society. We just don't like the one these other guys have because it's too liberal. So we're going to create our own and create our own convention. Um, and this organization is this loose fellowship. Uh, it's larger than a local church. People send donations to it. They pay membership fee. But nothing that's decided at the convention is binding on any of the churches. They don't have to do anything, just like the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, I didn't know this until I took a course at Southern Baptist Seminary uh, in church administration, which I had to finish in order to, to finish the program. Uh, nothing the Southern Baptist Convention does is binding on any Southern Baptist church. And we talked before about the fact that the convention among the Baptists, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, Eastern Baptist, that's what the Campbells left when they started the Missionary Society. They, they, it was basically a convention by a, another name. Well, now, if, if, a, if a Southern Baptist church consistently flaunted whatever the convention decided, um, they'd probably be invited to leave the convention. But of course, if they're consistently flaunting and going against the convention, they probably want to leave the convention anyway, which is often what happens, is they get this kind of, you can't fire me, I quit situation. But the point here is that among the restoration churches, you get this three-way division. And among churches of Christ, which is actually, if we're going to extend this, hard to get all of this on one chart, if we were going to extend this, Churches of Christ, what's on the next slide, would be to the right of this. So you have the most liberal part of it, the Christian church, the disciples. If you want to tell the difference just by driving down the street so you don't have to go and find out, the disciples is the group, their official symbol is the red chalice, the, the communion cup that has the cross on it. Usually it's red with a white cross. Sometimes they'll make the cross red against a white background, but that's their official denominational symbol. It's like, you know, the Methodists have the flame going up the side of the cross. Well, the disciples' official symbol is this chalice with the, the cross kind of at a 45-degree angle. Then you get the kind of middle-of-the-road people. And a lot of the folks, frankly, that are in the North American Christian Convention are still pretty conservative. Uh, when I lived in Danville, a town of 15,000 in central Kentucky uh, near Lexington, one of my best friends over the years was the guy that preached at the Independent Christian Church. We worked together on a lot of community projects. Uh, he was as opposed to alcohol as I was. We, we led an, an anti-alcohol referendum a couple of times. Uh, he believes in miracles. Uh, he believes in everything that the Bible says as far as the miraculous is concerned. He believes it's the word of God. He still speaks the language of restoring New Testament Christianity. We have a lot in common. Now, they use the instrument. And they have puppet shows, and they do a lot of things that uh, some of our liberal brethren do. But I once made the observation that I had more in common with him in the Christian church 
than I did with the guy at the liberal institutional Church of Christ on the other side of town, which is so far out in left field, um, I can't even describe it. I mean, the guy that's in this group is more conservative, if you will, than the guy that's in the institutional liberal wing of Churches of Christ. And uh, so if you looked at Churches of Christ, which would be again over here on the right if we were putting all of this together, what's happened in Churches of Christ in the late 20th century, 21st century, is almost identical to that three-way split that I just described. You have people on the far left, and just to be candidly, uh, to name, name uh, churches that would be associated with or in the orbit of Pepperdine University, Abilene Christian, David Lipscomb University, uh, probably um, the, the, the more conservative colleges sort of in the middle here, the moderate group that doesn't go along with all of that, um, is, uh, would be probably Harding and so forth. But um, did I put my picture of the tattooed lady up last time, Bill? I think I thought I did. A couple of years ago, and I, I, when they did this, I said, I'm never going back to Pepperdine. I've tried to speak there a couple of times, but they put up, they had as invited, an invited speaker at their lectureship, a woman Lutheran pastor, Nadia Bowles Weber is her name, in Denver. And uh, she's got tattoos everywhere. She hosts drinking parties, though on a Sunday night at her Lutheran church, they have beer and hymns. And her rationale for it is, well, Luther did it, so it must be okay, right? If Martin Luther did it, why, well, we'll, you know, we're Lutheran, we'll do it too. And uh, the Washington Post description of her is the most foul-mouthed preacher you'll ever hear. So this Christian college asked her to come and be a keynote speaker on their lectureship. And as, a, as the dean of another Christian college uh, said to me, we were eating dinner one day, and he said, what? And it's not far to college, but he said, what, what were those boys smoking when they asked this woman to come? I mean, you, it, it's, it's a wonder. So, so there, there are the people and institutions. Now, I personally, my theory is, uh, they had just invited a woman to come and be the chaplain at Pepperdine. And so if you're going to give cover for that, then you have somebody even more outlandish to come. And uh, I ought to put that picture up, Bill. I may have it on here at some point. But anyway, this gives you an idea of where we're going. So looking at churches of Christ in the 20th century, what you have particularly after World War II is you get a kind of a new generation of leadership. Daniel Summer died in 1940, F.D. Shrigley died in 1940, J.D. Tant died in 1940, three or four well-known preachers who'd been preaching for 50, 60, 70 years, all of them died within about a 12 or 15 month period. And you get this new generation of leadership. You also get a kind of an upward social mobility spiral after World War II, building a lot of buildings, uh, the church moved out beyond the tracks often met in a little frame building. We talked about this, I think, last time. And you get the expansion of colleges um, that had to do with the GI Bill. A lot of, uh, before World War II, maybe 10 or 12% of Americans went to college. College education was largely for the upper or upper middle classes, uh, with one exception. There were a lot of normal schools, teacher colleges. So there were a lot of people that were educated on scholarship at teacher colleges. After World War II, uh, way upwards of 50% of people, and probably today approaches 75 or 80%, maybe more people who go to college of some kind or another. So you get all these colleges being built or being expanded, and in addition to the GI Bill, which paid for a lot of this, uh, and also gave the colleges a lot of equipment. I mean, most of the colleges to house this, uh, this increase in their uh, membership and their students, they would uh, take uh, GI Quonset huts that were now a surplus and set them up on a uh, part of campus and that's where you lived if you were, uh, were a GI. Orphanages grew li by leaps and bounds. Before 1940 or in 1940 there were five orphanages in Churches of Christ. Uh, I think I can name them. Potter, um, Child Haven down in Coleman, uh, Bowles Home in Quinlan, uh, Tipton in Oklahoma, and uh, what am I leaving out? Um, uh, Tennessee Orphan Home, those five. By the end of the 1960s, there were at least 40, maybe as many as 50 orphanages that had been started, and all of them had their hand out begging for money. 
all of them wanting the churches to support them, as the colleges did. The colleges also made an argument, you need to, uh, you need to support our, our Bible department especially, because where else are you going to get preachers if we don't train your preachers for you? Now, um, which one of those would have more appeal, you think, a college or an orphanage? Well, all right, maybe. Yeah, it depends on who you are. But if you're trying, if you're trying to sell your organization, and you're in a place where colleges are kind of viewed as uh, intellectual and elite, and a lot of people still are not able to go there, and somebody goes off to college and they come out with a big head and they think they know more than you do, but your sales pitch for the orphanage is here's this poor little orphan kid. In, in a tattered dress or a tattered shirt and they've got a tear running down their face. You, which one of those you want to try to sell to the brethren? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Being pushed everywhere. I can remember as a kid um, before we moved to Emerson Avenue, we are at Irvington, which is probably at that time the largest church north of the Ohio River possible exception to Thayer Street in Akron. Uh, I mean, there's a large church, Earl West, that wrote the Search for the Ancient Order, was the preacher there, um, performed the marriage ceremony for my mom and dad. And when he left to go teach at Freed Hardiman, they got another guy in there who was very much pro-orphanage. And I can remember a guy is coming and on a Sunday night and, uh, preaching a short 10, 15 minute sermon and then they would get their charts out and do their picture show about, uh, here's why you need to support our orphanage. Um, and that's a pretty easy sell. And in fact, the, the guys who were promoting the college kind of felt the sting of that you could get support for an orphanage, but churches were by and large not willing to support a college. So you had a couple of fellows, N.B. Hardiman, who was the president of Freed Hardiman, and Basil Barrett Baxter, who was at David Lipscomb, and was the, ch the chief speaker on the Herald of Truth. You could hear him all over the United States. Anybody ever hear Batsel Barrett Baxter on the Herald of Truth radio TV program? I did. Grew up listening to him. When I preached in Florida, a bunch of us would carpool back from North Florida every Sunday, and at 8 o'clock, we tuned in WLAC in Nashville, which had a southern, we pick it up in Florida, and we listened to Batsel Barrett Baxter on the Herald of Truth radio program. And the argument these guys made was is that the college and the orphanage do what? Can anybody finish the sentence? They stand or fall together. The same principle that would justify a church giving money to an orphanage is the same principle that would justify a church giving money to a college because they're both doing the work of the church. I mean, they were very blatant about it. The church cannot function in orphan care unless you give to these orphanages. The church cannot do the work of this institution. Well, there's a sense in which that's true. The church is not in the orphanage business. So if it's going to do institutional orphan care, it's going to have to use somebody's orphanage. So we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the question is, did God really intend for the church to get into the institutional orph orphanage business? Did God intend for the church to get into the college business? No. So if you're going to send your kids or your preacher to college, then you're going to have to pay the college. And that was the argument that the church ought to do this because we're training preachers for the church. So there was that issue, sponsoring churches, which were relatively rare in the early 20th century, now become all the, the vogue. This is where a large church uh, like Highland and Abilene would take in money from 3,000 smaller churches in order to put on the uh, Herald of Truth program, which cost buckets of money, even when it was just radio. And then if you go to TV like they did in 1952, now you're 10, 15, 20 times more expensive than radio. Uh, and after all, if we're churches of Christ and we're building all these new buildings and we want to show that we're as good as the Christian church, we can build a building just as good as the Baptist, and that was the pitch that was being made, then we need to have uh, the Baptist have the Baptist hour, the Catholics got Fulton Sheen, the Lutherans have the Lutheran hour, we need to have the Church of Christ hour. And we need to put somebody like Batsel Barrett Baxter, Ph.D., on the air and let people see this, this is what churches of Christ are like. It was a, it was a PR sort of thing. And these sponsoring churches uh, grew up to, to in, in case of Highland and Abilene, to do the TV program. Other churches um, in Texas usually, would, or but Union Avenue in Memphis, said we will take the oversight of the work in Japan. Or we will take the oversight of the work in Germany. All these GIs who came back from the war and had seen the devastation in Japan and Germany and Italy and other places, 
uh, they, they were interested in sending funds back over there to help spread the gospel. Well, how do you do that? Well, these people organized these sponsoring churches that said, we will take the oversight of the work in Italy, the work in Germany, the work in Japan, and if you want to work there, then you have to work through us. And in some cases, they made agreements with the governments of these countries that they would be the sole representative of churches of Christ. If you wanted to go there and preach, you couldn't go just as somebody being sent by a local church. Uh, you had to get the recognition of the government authority. So you get these television ministries sponsoring churches and so forth. Uh, the orphanages, um, I mentioned a few of them. You get this growth of colleges, uh, and you get this orphanage college linking the church uh, stands or falls together. When Hardiman said that in 1947, uh, that was a little bit too early. Uh, churches weren't buying it. Uh, a lot of churches were still um, in, in a growth process. By 1962, 15 years later, when Baxter gets up this big church in Nashville and preaches this sermon that get, and then gets printed in a pamphlet and mailed out 100,000 copies mailed out all over the country, and he says the orphanage stands or falls together, here's the representative of Churches of Christ on the Herald of Truth saying it's okay to, for a church to send to a college. And in some ways that, that carried the day. But those are the kinds of, instant, when we talk about institutionalism, that's what we're talking about. All of these colleges, orphanages, homes for unwed mothers, homes for the aged, um, many of which, by the way, have gone out of business. A lot of these orphanages have, have gone bankrupt and sometimes taken down their sponsoring churches with them. Uh, I think the central church in Houston within the last decade or so, I think if I'm uh, reliably informed, had to sell their, their property in order to pay off the, the closure of, uh, of an orphanage that they were responsible for. And it also um, uh, lays bare a, a distinction between some of the people who argued for orphanages. Most of the orphanages um, east of the Mississippi River, uh, Coleman in Alabama, Potter in Kentucky, uh, Tennessee Orphan Home, uh, Schultz Lewis, uh, which over here uh, in Valparaiso, which um, when Earl West left Indianapolis and went to teach at Freed Hardeman, another guy came in my grandfather uh, resigned as an elder in conjunction with a, the more liberal, there were five elders. They disagreed pretty vehemently over this issue. They said, let's resign to keep the peace, let the other three guys run it. Um, that didn't work too well. Uh, my dad was a deacon and the treasurer there, and ultimately he was told, you either write a check to Schultz Lewis Orphanage or you can turn in the checkbook and go somewhere else if you can't get with the program. Now that doesn't leave a young man in his 30s much room to maneuver. And so that's when we wound up going to this other church where the, the Sommer uh, family had been for 50 years. Um, but, and I forgot where I was going with that before I started. Oh, these orphanages that were uh, east of Mississippi were largely run by boards. That is, they were not a part of the church. They were not overseen by churches. They were independent agencies that were legally owned and operated by a board of directors. Um, usually members of the church, whereas most of the orphanages west of the Mississippi, which would be the Texas and, and Oklahoma orphanages, uh, were actually overseen by churches. Uh, Jean? How did they determine what orphans went to these orphanages? That's, was it something that had to be, they had to be related somehow to the um, I, I think it varied from orphanage to orphanage, and I, I'm not an expert in that. I, you'd have to do some research to really answer that, but it's one interesting point of that is I think, generally speaking, uh, they, they took um, children that, were, that came largely out of Churches of Christ but I, because the Baptists had their own orphanages and the Lutherans had theirs and so forth. But I think they probably, many of them, would take orphans if they could find financial backing for them. Usually what happened was... If a church, I know of a case in Indianapolis where there was an orphan, not a true orphan, but a mother who couldn't care for her children. And so they took the children out of the home and they sent them down to Potter on the premise that the church would take from its treasury and send money to Potter Orphanage in order to foot the bill for this, uh, rather than caring for the child by putting the child in a, in a foster home. Now, which, which was the, the model nationwide that nearly everybody else was using was to get out of the orphanage business. State orphanages, denominational orphanages were largely closing their doors or scaling back because they recognized 
that's not a very good way to raise young children. Just put them in a warehouse, put them in a dormitory, have a dorm parent for 30 kids. That's not very good. And so they began to move to a foster home model where you actually put the child in a, a, a natural home and the parents in that home became in loco parentis in the place of the natural parents, if you will. Now, a foster care model, as we all know, has its own boatload of problems. Uh, that's not a perfect solution either because sometimes the parents are not screened, sometimes they're doing it just to get money from the state or from some other agency, uh, but it sure is a much more natural or biblical model than putting the kids in a warehouse somewhere. So Churches of Christ were just getting into the orphanage business, the warehouse business, if you will, as everybody else was getting out of it. So it's like a lot of other things. We tend to be kind of 50 years behind what everybody else is doing. Uh, we're just getting into it. Churches of Christ largely got into bus ministries in the 1970s when a lot of the Baptist churches were getting out of the bus ministry. Um, and so that's a kind of a pattern. One other interesting thing, um, particularly in, in uh, places, I don't know about Schultz Lewis, but at Potter, at, at Coleman, at Child Haven, they actually had written into their charters that they would not take um, what were then called Negro children, African American children. So it didn't matter from where or by who or what the circumstance was, if you were African American, you, you sorry, doors closed. And in fact, I have a friend who preached in Minneapolis for years and actually was able to persuade a number of people to leave some of the African American churches up there and, and come to worship by it. He'd just take, <laughs> he'd just take a copy of some of the orphanage newsletters that he got and he'd just say, you see any black kids here? You know, these are, these are white segregationist institutions. And uh, so in, in a sense, it just makes the point they're, they're kind of culture bound. They're, they're a part of their own society, if you will. So other than that, I don't know how to answer your question, but I, I think largely these were, for the most part, children that came from some source in Churches of Christ. But I'm pretty sure that if somebody else offered to send a child and send them money to cover that, that, that they would take it. Because, I mean, it's, it costs money to run this, whether you think it's right for churches to do it or not. Every institution requires funds to, to run the place. So my guess is that if there was enough money involved in it, that they would happily take a child from some other source. But the, the idea originally was they would come from, from Churches of Christ. So my point is you get all of these institutions of a wide variety, including a lot that are not on here, and it was almost like the Churches of Christ got into an institutional mania that you, if, if you're not supporting an orphanage, then you're anti-orphan. If you're not supporting a college, you're anti-education. If you're not supporting Union Avenue in Memphis to help these guys go preach in Japan, or you're not supporting Brownwood, Texas to go help somebody preach in Germany or Italy, you're not supporting the Herald of Truth, and you're, you don't believe in evangelism. You don't believe in sharing the gospel. You've got to participate in our program, or you've got to, uh, you need to you know, give it up and go somewhere else. And so there was a lot of rhetoric, there was a lot of labeling, a lot of name calling, and a lot of uh, institutional uh, begging and pushing, if you will. And um, I, I am still of an age that I can remember as a small kid some of this back and forth. I don't remember anything from the whole toddy debate when I was five, but I, I can remember things from when I was 9, 10, 11, 12 years old as my parents were having to leave one congregation. And, I had to leave all my Sunday school buds and guys that I'd known for several years and, you know, ran around in the parking lot with and crawled around under the pews during the service <laughs> from time to time. I'd leave all my buddies and drive halfway across Indianapolis uh, to go to another church. And I'm like, why, why are we doing this? You know, what's the deal? And, uh, but I understood some of it. So that, that's some of the developments here. These institutional issues hardened um, through some of the writing in the papers. Uh, some of which uh, on the left side were largely older papers that uh, were pro-orphanage, um, pro-college for the most part. And there were others then on the right side that were begun specifically uh, to, to counter some of these things. Uh, the Gospel Guardian, 1940, Truth Magazine actually was a Chicago land publication started by Leslie Diesel Camp and others who were preaching in the Chicago area in 1956. Although their focus at that time was largely a lot of guys in Churches of Christ had, were, were leaving the church and going to the disciples because uh, they had been educated in the University of Chicago or other places and were leaving. 
when Leslie then founded the paper, went to Nigeria for a year or two and came back, he said the focus had changed and now the churches were more concerned about supporting orphanages and colleges. Uh, Searching the Scriptures was started in 1960, uh, largely by the, the faculty at uh, Florida College, um, although it was soon uh, sold to a private uh, owner and, and run after that. There were a lot of these debates. The first one was that uh, debate I referenced in Indianapolis, but then there were a number of them. But over that five or six year period, by 1960, um, the lines had been pretty firmly drawn in most places. And you were either in an anti-church or you were in a, quote, mainstream church, as they sometimes like to call themselves. And there's all kinds of pressure to line up during this time. Um, Florida College was threatened, and in fact, its main donor pulled out and pulled his money out of the college in the mid-1950s, nearly sent them into bankruptcy, and actually threatened their accreditation in the mid-1950s. The CEI bookstore, started by Benny Lee Fudge in Athens, Alabama, opened a store in Abilene. They were put out of business there because of a, of a boycott uh, by churches that said, if you won't line up with us, then we're not going to patronize your business. Um, people were said to be anti-foreign evangelism. Yes, that has too many ends in it there. Uh, you won't help a starving orphan. Um, fertilizer bags waved from the pulpit in some of these debates. You aunties would pay to put fertilizer on the church lawn or the preacher's house, and you won't send a dime to help a starving orphan. Um, And and a dime, by the way, was about the average contribution. Somebody did um, a a calculation when all this stuff was going on and calculated that the average support per member per week of churches that sent to an orphanage. Anybody want to guess how much they were sending per member per week? Dividing the church over this stupendous sum. Anybody want to take a guess? Seven cents. Seven cents per member per week was what they were getting uh, being sent from church treasuries to that. Um, Either write a check or resign. My dad was not the only one to go through that kind of an experience. If you look at the ads in the Gospel Advocate, no anti need apply. Uh, if you're an anti, you don't even need this. If you want to preach here, you know, if your preachers were told, if you don't quit preaching this anti doctrine, you won't have any place to preach. A lot of preachers were fired because they dared to teach the truth on these issues and, and were let go. Meetings were canceled. Uh, the Gospel Advocate for several years printed confessions of preachers who recanted. Earl West was one of them, said, I used to be an anti, but now I confess that that was a sin and I don't teach that doctrine anymore and I'm available for meetings because there was a lot of pressure uh, put on people to line up with that. Um, I had one brother who told me that church where he was, and he said, I'm not the only one. We send $10 a month to an orphanage just so we won't get labeled anti. We're not really sold on that's the best thing to do, but just there's too much pressure, so it's just easier to write a $10 check and send it to the orphanage. This is in the late 1960s uh, than to get plastered with the label uh, anti. And so, I mean, you get all kinds of stuff like this. The only anti-church in the Bible is Antioch. (laughs) And that's about the level of biblical argument that a lot of these people could make about that. Um, There were lawsuits. The church at Expressway, where I preached in in Louisville, started as as a result of a lawsuit at Taylor Boulevard that was splashed across the pages of both daily newspapers. Brethren were locked out of the building. Uh, One of the elders at Expressway told me that one day out in the lobby, four big brothers who were opposed to him got to just pushing him around. He said, I felt like a football. They just pushed me physically from one guy to the other, and he pushed me on to the next guy. My wife's dad was actually struck with a fist, a closed fist, by an elder in a church in Middle Tennessee because he dared to preach against uh, what the churches should not be engaged in this kind of, of institutional uh, orphanage business or other things. And in fact, at another place where he then went to preach, um, one night six or eight of the other brothers had to form a sort of cordon around him to get into his car because there were other brothers who were just so incensed at this that, I mean, it was just an ugly time, not everywhere maybe, but in a lot of places. Um, I mean, I, I sometimes say, well, People will say that this was this just happened in a few places. Well, there's a whole list of stuff that could be duplicated a hundred times over 
So it, it's not like it happened everywhere, but it happened enough uh, that that. Now, time passes. If we go back to this uh, chart here, things don't stay the same over a period of a generation or two. So what starts out, where in the 1950s, the institutional moderates, what came, what came to be called the liberals, liberals they kind of be all together. Um, for one thing, they're concentrated on their anti-anti. <laughs> they're against the antis. But over time, those groups begin to separate. And so from 1950, or from the 1950s to 1985, when several hundred of these institutional preachers became so concerned with the direction of things that were going among institutional churches, and the guys that signed this expression of concern uh, read like a who's who of the people who argued for the orphanages and TV programs in the 1950s, but a lot of the younger preachers a generation later now, 30, 35 years later, are now taking things way beyond anywhere that they thought they ought to go. So they said, we are deeply disturbed over the liberalism that's so evident in the brotherhood today. By liberalism, we mean the following five items. They specify five things. Number one, or A, there's a drifting from the Bible-centered, definitive, distinctive doctrine that once characterized our preaching. Many of our people, including preachers and elders, no longer know the difference between true Christianity and the corrupted forms of it so prevalent today. So our preaching has changed, they're saying. There is a concerted effort, secondly, on the part of some brethren to restructure the organization, the worship, and the work of the church along sectarian lines. If the Baptists do it, we want to do it. If the Lutherans are doing it, we want it. And if it means we have to restructure the worship, it means we have to, we don't want to go as far as instrumental music, but if we can bring in a praise team and uh, have somebody spit in the mic and sound like a bass drum, uh, or somebody else sound like a violin or a clarinet, why, we'll do that. They just stand behind the singers so nobody really sees what they're doing. Um, and so they're, they're concerned about that sort of thing. A spirit of doctrinal compromise and fellowshipping of those in blatant religious error has permeated our ranks. Now these are not antis that are saying this. These are guys that are in the institutional camp with both feet up to their neck in these institutions, but they are scared about the direction that a lot of people are going. Fourth, the world has made alarming inroads into the church. Instead of the church influencing the world for righteousness, the world has adversely affected many brethren in matters of morality and conduct of life. And I'll pause here to say, this is 1986, 85 maybe. It's now 2016. We're 30 years out from that. Does anybody see anything among conservative churches of Christ that might be a little bit like this? Has the preaching changed? Has the world influenced the church rather than the church influencing the world? You say the same thing, uh, so it's not like our skirts are clean, so to speak, or our, we got a clean, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Yeah, all of them. All of them are. And then finally, they said the typical emphasis of the denominational world on recreation, entertainment, and solving the social ills of society has been incorporated into the programs of many congregations supplanting the God-given work of meeting the spiritual needs of those both within and without the body of Christ. I have to tell you, I first read this, I almost had to refrain from laughing out loud at this. I mean, these are the guys who started this. They're the ones who put the emphasis on the recreation, on the, the hot dog for vacation Bible school, on the, the bus with the lucky seat, uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, bringing in uh, kids with uh, some kind of recreational program, building a family life center, uh, putting Pac-Man uh, games in the basement so that the kids would have something to do afterwards. And now they're wringing their hands and crying about recreation and about all of this stuff. I mean, it just makes you want to scratch your head. But the point is, this was 30 years, a generation later from when these folks started doing that, and now they're wringing their hand at doing that. Willard Collins who was uh, either president or vice president, I forget which, at David Lipscomb, wrote a memoir late in his life, this is 1986, and he was asked to compare church members in the 1980s when he was in his last decade with those 50 years earlier when he started preaching in the 1930s. Here's what he said. I don't think they see the glory of the church unencumbered with denominationalism as I did when I was growing up. I don't think members of the church see it as different from Protestantism. Just, we're just as good as or just like the evangelicals. 
uh, he says, uh, whoop, let me get back to the previous one. He said, when I started preaching, a lot of members of the church believed Protestants needed to be saved. You couldn't be in a Baptist church and, and be saved, and now we've got people, uh, he's saying, that kind of believe the Baptists are okay, or the Presbyterians or whatever. At an earlier time, they felt the church was a lot better than Protestantism. And he says, we have lost a lot of that. So I want to move now to ask more doctrinal kinds of questions. Maybe I should stop before we do that. It's 11, so we've been at this an hour. Anybody have questions? Um, I can, you can wind me up and I'll go as long as I want. Usually we've gone for another half an hour or so with questions and I can do that. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. yep. conversation uh, fair I mean you could say this I mean the same thing happened at Downers Grove the people that were there Gene you probably could tell us tales about Joliet or Elgin or some of these different places and Bill and uh, Ray and the rest of you too I'm sure could do that um, I had a conversation uh, with a, a family that I stayed with in Tampa we were, when we were doing the last recording that we did for the symphonia the, for the hymnal and uh, I had, it turns out, I had known her when she was smaller. At a, she grew up in a church in North Dakota, and I used to go up there and do, uh, do meetings uh, every summer. But uh, she said, I went to Harding College because the church that I grew up with in North Dakota, a small church, we didn't hear much preaching, she said, except for what you did, uh, on these kinds of issues. And so when I got ready to go to college, I went to Harding. And she said, I can still remember, and this would have been in the 1980s that she was there, I can remember people talking in the dorm and laughing, ridiculing the aunties. And she said, I didn't know what that was. Uh, and then she said, I, I started to study and I, I you know, wrote to some preachers and so forth and I found out I'm an auntie. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of people have had that kind of experience. But she said, even in the 1980s, there was still this kind of prejudice um, against, um, uh, against uh, what, what was called anteism. Well. Here, here's the question, it seems to me. What kind of church did Christ die for? I mean, did Jesus die, going back to that last part, are we supposed to, to be a, with a spiritual emphasis that tries to convert people and save their souls or have the Lord save their souls? Or did Jesus die for daycare centers, job placement bureaus, adult education courses, medical and dental clinics, English as second language classes? That's what goes on in a lot of the institutional churches. Now, let me be clear. All of those are wonderful works. There ought to be daycare centers. People need job placement bureaus. It's good to have adult education classes so people can go out and make more money. Somebody comes and they don't know English, they need to learn English as their second language. It's good to have medical and dental clinics. The question is, is that the work of the church? Or is that the work of state government or the work of non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross or what have you? Is that what Christ died for? And my answer is no, I can't read anything about that. Now, um, another interesting quotation that I came across, this is from a guy now deceased, Abe Mallerby, a well-known New Testament scholar, wrote a number of commentaries. Uh, for a long time, uh, he was professor of New Testament interpretation at Yale, uh, South African converted by Eldred Eccles or under his preaching, came to Abilene, did his bachelor's there, and then went to Harvard, got his PhD, taught for decades at Yale. And when he, uh, when he retired, um, three of the six candidates that they interviewed to replace him for the Buckingham chair were his former students and Abilene graduates, and the one who finally got the job was one of his former students from Abilene. So this guy, here's a guy who's, who's heavyweight, uh, his credentials are impeccable, and here's what he said when he retired in 2002 and the Christian Chronicle interviewed him. They said, what are some of your concerns for our fellowship? And here's what he said. My major concern is our cozying up to those evangelicals, conservative Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, who are still kind of Bible believers, 
who put a premium on feeling at the expense of reason. They, they, they're more inf interested in what do you feel about things than what does the Bible say or what can you show from the Bible. Evangelical priorities and language have come to suffuse, <clears throat> to in fact, to, to be a large part of much of the preaching in our fellowship. <clears throat> and he said that, combined with a style of preaching which is common in all churches these days, that is narratival and anecdotal. Those are fancy words for tell me a story. Make me jer jerk a few tears. Tell me about your mother on her deathbed. Tell me about your pet that died. Tell me about your little girl. <clears throat> Tell me something. Rather than expository, rather than taking the Bible and opening it up to a text and saying, here is what the Word of God says. A lot of preaching has gone to the emotional, the tear jerking, the anecdotal, the tell me a story, rather than open up the Bible and tell me what the Bible says. And he said that results in sermons that are as theologically thin gruel as many of the so-called praise songs we sing. Man, I wish I had said that. <laughs> I have become known in some quarters <clears throat> as the guy who came up with the, the 7-Eleven songs. You heard this? Seven words, sing them 11 times. <clears throat> praise songs. Well, I wish I had said that, but it, that's, that was not, I didn't invent it. I borrowed it from somebody else, but I have used it a lot. And he says, it seems that the goal of many services is to achieve an emotional response without imparting biblical knowledge. We don't really care what the Bible says. We just want to get an emotional response to somebody. If we can get people in the aisle that are emotional and if we can get them waving their hands or you know, whatever, almost like a semi-Pentecostal service, uh, that's what we're doing. Well... Beyond the debates, <clears throat> what's happened since then? Uh, some of you may be aware of the Arlington meeting in 1968, which brought brethren together um, to discuss in a closed session, so there's no audience to play to, um, what is the work of the church? What's the difference in an individual work and a congregational work? Um, what kind of fellowship can we have with each other? Uh, different questions like that. What what institutions, if any, <clears throat> should the church support? And uh, <clears throat> when I this occurred when I my last year at Florida College, I remember Melvin Curry and Clinton Hamilton and others who went and, and spoke at this meeting, coming back and in classes they would talk a little bit about it. Uh, when I got married the next spring and moved to Marion, the, one of the first things that I did that Cecil Willis gave me as a, a task was to proofread the galleys for the Arlington Meeting book. And it's still available. If you don't have it and you want a kind of a definitive study of these kinds of issues, that's the thing to have. In 1988, uh, I was asked to organize a similar meeting uh, in Nashville that we just ingeniously called the Nashville meeting that brought hundreds, we opened it up this time, this wasn't a closed thing with just the speakers there, <clears throat> but we covered a lot of the same topics and we had literally hundreds of people who came. We met, instead of meeting in a church building, I put it in a hotel, the Doubletree Hotel in downtown Nashville, and as you can tell, we not only filled a huge ballroom, we had, over, we had to put chairs out in the hallway so that people could have a place to sit for three days uh, we had brothers who came and spoke. The way we organized it was um, I picked uh, two guys, one on each side of the issue, a different perspective of the issue, and they spoke for 30 minutes on an assigned topic, either fellowship or the work of the church. I spoke on the history. That, that's how this thing got, got started, actually. And then the other person spoke, and then two other brothers gave a response to that. That took the first hour of each session. Then they sat around or stood at the podium and ask each other questions and talk, and for the most part, it's pretty brotherly. And then the third hour, we took questions from the audience. So everybody on the panel uh, would be answering questions. There was a moderator that would take the questions. For the most part, uh, everybody, uh, we, we didn't act like a pack of hyenas, as often happens, but I, I didn't want it to be in a church building where everybody comes and one side sits on this side and the other side sits on that side and they listen to speeches and then they go home and nobody changes their mind. I wanted people to be able to sit in the coffee shop afterwards or say, you know, come up to the room and let's sit and talk about this. Some of that happened, uh, not nearly enough. So when some of them who didn't like what happened on the other side uh, said, can we have another meeting? Uh, I organized another one in Dallas in, in 1990. When I say what happened on the other side, um, and because there was a wide spectrum of beliefs on the institutional side of the question, 
all of that spread that we talked about before. I mean, we had guys who stood up on the institutional side and said things like, we did not have the Bible for 400 years after the New Testament era, so how could we unite on it? Roman Catholic position. Roman Catholic Church gave us the Bible after 400 years, so we didn't have the Bible for 400 years, so how could, how could churches go by it? Um, another guy, a preacher at one of the biggest churches in Dallas, which had just built a huge family life center, got up and said, um, well, if we want to do that, if we want to build a family life center, we don't really care whether the Bible authorizes it or not. If we think it will help spread the gospel, if we think it will help our members, <clears throat> we're going to do it, whether we can find a passage that gives us the authority to do it or not. Now, I knew that's what they were saying because I've been going to some of their men. I've tried to, sort of like Don Quixote tilting at windmills for years, I've tried to keep some communication open between guys on the other side so that when they got ready to meet, I was about to only Andy that they knew. Um, <clears throat> but I knew what they were saying, and when they came to me and said, can we organize this meeting, uh, I didn't know whether that was a good idea or not because I could imagine a lot of our young guys, some of whom were in my classes at Danville, who might hear what these fellows were saying and what, what if they found that persuasive? What if they went to the, other, went to the dark side of the force, if you will? And then I, I lost sleep over that a lot of nights, and then I realized that, well, if they're going to do that, then it's better for them to do it at 20 than to do it at 40 when they have some influence among churches and um, but I also, you know, I tried to be honest with them. I said, look, I know the arguments these guys make. If somebody has come up with a new biblical argument, a more persuasive argument, something that, you know, scripture says this, I want you to hear it. I mean, if, if there's biblical authority for doing this, then what do we need to do? We need to start doing it. We, we need not to say, well, you know, my dad opposed this, and I wouldn't want to go against what my dad did. No. If there's biblical authority for something, then we need to start doing that. And what, what happened was that it could not have been a better experience for a lot of younger preachers who had not grown up hearing this and kind of had this idea that, well, this was a controversy that was just a preacher fuss, and it was just a lot of preachers that squabbled and quibbled with each other and acted like a pack of hyenas and and to, for them to hear right from these guys mouth we didn't have the Bible for 400 years and so there's no scriptural authority or we don't care whether there's scriptural authority or not well some of the guys on that team if you will they were just as appalled at that as as I was I mean guys like Roy Lanier Stafford North uh, individuals who are pretty conservative even yet uh, I mean, they, so they came to me, Johnny Ramsey was one of them, they said, can we do this again, and we'll do it in Dallas, and uh, we just invite the conservative end of things. And so, so we did, and then I said, if somebody else wants to do this, have at it, I'm, I'm done, I'm not organizing anymore. If it's just me organizing it, then that's not worth much. So a few years later, Jim organized this meeting that produced this book. Uh, interestingly, I've gotten a, a couple of calls and conversation just in the last few weeks. Uh, the editor of the Gospel Advocate, fairly new editor, excuse me, my allergies are driving me crazy. I apologize. Um, they want some of us who they know to be um, on the other side uh, to come to Nashville in May and sit down at the Gospel Advocate office and talk with them about is there any way we can heal this breach? Because they're very concerned about this wide spectrum of churches that's headed out the left field door. So these are people that are much more conservative. Well, I'm going to tell them I don't know of anything that can be done other than start teaching the truth, but I'm willing to go anywhere at any time and talk to somebody who wants to sit down and talk about uh, what does the Bible teach. I don't know what will come of that. I'm kind of like David Lipscomb who said, um, this is my father-in-law's rendition of this. I've not ever been able to locate it, but as I've said before, if, if Lipscomb didn't say this, he should have. Um, he said, supposedly, my fa I asked my father-in-law where, where he had read this, and he couldn't remember. But the quotation I've heard him use a number of times, apostasies come and will come. When they come, they come in the midst of an untaught, ease-loving, self-serving generation. If that doesn't describe the world that we live in, Brothers and sisters, I ask you, what does? And th that's Lipscomb's idea about it. Well, all right, so what, what is the Lord's church? We talk about it being the undenomination. 
Some of you are as old or maybe even older than I am. You can remember the Uncola commercials, right? Uh, 7-Up had this big ad campaign back in the 60s and 70s, the Uncola. Well, we say we're the undenomination. We're, we're not a denomination. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what does, what, what is the church? What does this word church mean? And we often make the point that it comes from a compound Greek word, ekklesia, from the word kaleo, to call, and ek means out of. So the called out, we sometimes re render it, but in common usage in the New Testament, it simply meant an assembly. Those who were called out of a larger body or called together sometimes is how it's, it's used. And uh, the, the Bible uses the term in that way. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 just to look at a couple of quick examples of that. Peter talks about here those who were called, you're a royal priesthood, chosen race, holy nation, people of God's own possession, so forth, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's this word, word for called out, and it's used in a number of other places. Normally, it's used as assembly. It's most often translated by the word assembly, and it was used even before the Bible was written. It's a common Greek word, and people that spoke Greek um, know this word. If you look at Acts 19, there's some biblical examples of how the word is used in different senses. In Acts 19, Paul's in Ephesus. They get upset about uh, the Diana of the Ephesians, uh, their livelihood being cut off, the silversmiths. And so for several hours they meet in the, in the, uh, um, the amphitheater that's there. It's still there. If you visit Ephesus today, you can sit in that amphitheater. They have, uh, have concerts and gatherings there. Well, if you look at 19 and verse 32, this word ecclesia is used in this sense. Some were shouting one thing and some another for the assembly, the, the ecclesia, was in confusion and the majority did not know for what cause they had come together. And then in verse 39, somebody with some sense stands up and says, if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly, the town council, the city council, if you will. Now, what is a city council? Well, city council is people who have been called out of the general population. They've been selected or elected to sit on the city council. Not everybody can sit on the city council. You have to be called out, and they come together. They assemble as the council in order to do that. And then in verse 41, after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. So the crowd has now quieted down. You have a huge crowd of people that are what? They're assembled. Now, they earlier were a mob, everybody just shouting and hollering, and not and nobody knew what was going on or even why, were they, why they were there. Or they could be a very quiet assembly listening to some person one person speak. Paul regulates this kind of thing in 1 Corinthians 14. He said if you're in an assembly and you get people with spiritual gifts and one saying this over there and one saying that and one saying this, what was Paul's instruction? Shut up and sit down. Yeah, let each one in turn say when then if somebody else gets a revelation, the other person should sit down. Let all things be done decently in order. But that's done in an assembly and that's the word for church. If you look, for instance, come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and there are several texts in which this is used. Uh, Paul says in 1 and verse 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son. So the church at Corinth are those who have been called into the fellowship. Earlier, even in verse 2, he says the church of God, the ecclesia of God, which is at Corinth, those who have been sanctified by Christ Jesus, saints by calling. They have been called out of the world, called together as an assembly. And then again in verse 24, he says, um, to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So as Christians, we're called out of the world, but we're also called together as an assembly. You can find other texts that use that. Now, as far as I can tell in the New Testament, this word ekklesia, when used of the church, now, it was a Greek word that was used of just an assembly, a, a mob, a, a city council. But the New Testament takes that word, ecclesia, and applies it, uses it to describe the church, to describe the church. And as far as I can tell, it's used in two senses. <clears throat> it's used in what sometimes people have called the, the universal church. Now, if you don't like that word, and some brethren object to it when I use it, um, please come up with a better word that describes it. I, I will be all ears. 
But if you want a biblical description of what I'm talking about, it's found in Hebrews chapter 12. The church and the general assembly of the firstborn ones, plural, whose names are enrolled in heaven. Everybody in every age, in every nation, in every place who's ever been a Christian, whoever's name is enrolled in the Lamb's book of life in any century, that's the universal church. Now the relevant question for us is, does that church ever function? And the answer is no. It can't function. Most of it's dead. <laughs> I mean, everybody from all the preceding centuries, they're in the grave. They can't function. And there are generations yet unborn, if the Lord delays his coming, who will become Christians and be in that great gentleness. The only time this universal church will ever function is, as we say in the hymn, when we all get to heaven. And what a glorious assembly that will be when we're all hymning the praise of God and casting our crowns at all of the things that are described in Revelation. But, but this universal church never functions. It can't function. I have sometimes wistfully thought when I've been overseas or come back home that wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be great if we could get all of the brethren in Lithuania or Moscow or China and Beijing and Shanghai and all the Australian brethren and all the brethren in India and all the ones in the Philippines, we could have an internet Church of Christ hookup. If we get enough cameras in enough places and everybody has their own big screen, you know, we'd have however many thousand split screens you had, and everybody could be online at the same time in all the time zones. Well, of course, you, you, you wouldn't have everybody. Somebody be sick or somebody be late or somebody whatever. Uh, somebody sleeps in, and uh, you, you couldn't do that. And besides that, even if you could, that's still just all the living people now. That doesn't resurrect all the dead people or forecast who the people in, in future generations will be. So this universal church exists in the Lamb's Book of Life. It will function one day when this world is no more, but on earth, it does not function, it cannot function. Well, so how does the church function? Well, the only other way I know that the scripture uses this word is in terms of local congregations. Galatians 1.22, the churches of Christ which are in Judea. Or 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, individual congregations, even so do you, you Corinthian brethren. And so you find this local congregation, a functioning unit of individual Christians who come together on the Lord's Day and at other times as well in order to do what? What do we mean by function? Do the work of the church. Do the work of the church. And as I have said before, trying to get this idea across, the most fundamental thing an ecclesia does is what? Yeah, it assembles, it gathers. We sometimes say, well, the work of the church is evangelism, edification, and benevolence. That's true, but we've got to add to that list, the work of the church is to assemble. If you don't get up on Sunday morning and come where other Christians are, not much else is going to happen. You won't have a collection for the saints to help needy. You won't have a collection to support the preaching of the gospel. Now, you can go off and sing hymns by yourself or pray by yourself, and you should. We shouldn't limit our singing and praying to what we do in the four walls of a building on Sunday morning. We ought to do that all the time in every place whenever the, whenever the notion strikes us to pray or to sing. We sure ought to study our Bibles. If all you're studying is for Bible class, and you only crack the Bible two or three times a week, that's not going to work. Um, so yes, we need to be individually doing but we need to do that together as Christians. That's what Christians do. They get up on Sunday. The Lord got up on Sunday, as someone said, we ought to do that too, and come where other Christians are in order to study his word, to edify each other, to help each other with our weaknesses, uh, to, to pool our resources, and that, that's what the church does as a functioning unit. Um, in order to function, there have to be, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to have much, I actually am not going to be able to unpack this. I think I'm going to quit with this idea. And then if you want me to come back, Bill, I can come back. But this, the, if I get started on this, there's a whole string of 25 slides behind this that we just don't have time for this morning. But think about, in terms of this functioning unit, any task, any work that gets done, has to have at least three things that happen. I, let's just say, if we're going to move this table down here, that looks pretty heavy. I don't think one guy can do that. So we need four brothers, one on each corner, to move this table. 
Now, in order to do it, three things have to happen. Number one, we have to agree to work together. If I say, I need, I need three other guys up here and all of you to sit there and look at me, is that table going to move? No. We have to agree. We're going to move this. We have to agree what we're going to do. We're going to move it over there by that heating unit. If each of the four of us takes off in a different direction, <laughs> where's that table going? It might budge in the direction the strongest guy moves it, but if we're not all working together, and we have to accept a common oversight. We have to say, uh, all right, on the count of three, we're going to lift this up and move that way. One, two, three, go. Otherwise, if I start picking it up and none of the rest of you are doing anything, especially with my bad back that I've had back surgery on, it's not going anywhere. And if, if, if Bill starts to lift after I quit lifting, then it's not going to go anywhere. So we have to say, all right, one, two, three, go that direction. And then we have to pool our resources. We have to, all of us, pool, in this case, kinetic energy, lifting power, walking power, in order to move it in that direction. So common oversight, agreement to work together, pooling of resources, and that happens in a congregation. What, how, do we, how do we pool our resources? Usually not kinetic energy, but what? We pool money. It's, it's the, the currency of the realm. It's how things get done. It's how the light bill gets paid. Now, we could put up a wind turbine, I suppose, out here and generate our own, but it's probably a lot easier just to pay the electric company. Uh, we could perhaps, if we got the permits, drill a deep well and have our own water supply. Maybe. I don't know if that's legal here or not. Um, but it's probably easier just to pay the municipal water company to deliver water to the building. Um, we, could, we could sit on a dirt floor or a pine floor. We don't have to have pews, do we? How many want to sit on the floor? Anybody want to sit on the floor? I don't think so. Why not have pews and behave in a civilized way? And by all means, let's pad those pews, okay? <laughs> Any, anybody ever sat on a hard church pew for an hour and a half long sermon? Yeah, I've been there, done that. Um, and, of course, we've got to have air conditioning in the summer, right? I know a preacher said, if you want to raise the contribution, back in the day when a lot of churches didn't have air conditioning back in the 50s, he said, you want to raise the church's contribution, just announce you're going to air condition the building. <laughs> the contribution will go up. Gene? Well, that's true. That that is true. We had to do fans, but yeah. we had to, or we had to draw on. Yeah, that's right. And and they also made a pretty good whap on the head. If you know, although my my dad would just use his knuckle. I mean, I'd get whopped upside the head with his his middle finger, which made an impression. <laughs> I'd try to go sit with my grandma when that happened. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what's what's the thing that says if mom says no, ask Nana. If Nana says no, who are we kidding? Nana never says no. <laughs> But you get the point of what I'm, what I'm saying. You have to pool resources, which in most cases is money. You have to agree to work together. If, if you have a squabbling congregation that can't agree on how to organize a two-car parade and everybody thinks the carpet ought to be this color, no, it ought to be that color, no, these are not good pews, we need to replace them, we need to change our service time to 9 instead of 10, we need to not meet on Sunday night, we need to put a steeple on the building, no, we can't do that. You ever heard churches squabble about stuff like that? All the time. I have sat in business meetings, I'm not making this up, and heard the brethren argue for 20 minutes over where to buy a box of chalk for the chalkboard, back when we had chalkboard before we went to overheads. I kid you not. Um, so how, how do we have common oversight? The biblical answer is to have an eldership. So don't get me started on this. I've got a thread, thread going on Facebook right now. I don't know anybody who thinks that more than a, a third of conservative churches of Christ have elders. My guess, I've held meetings in 40 states in hundreds of congregations. I could be wrong, but my guess it's more like one in four rather than one in three. So my question is, why don't we have more congregations that, that have elders? Why do we insist on a situation where you've got one little struggling congregation of less than 50 people and no elders and that have elders? Why do we insist on a situation where you've got one little struggling congregation of less than 50 people and no elders 
and four miles away, you've got another little struggling congregation. If you put them together, you might have enough critical mass to have an eldership, but the brethren don't want to do that because, as I put on my page, they often they want to have it their way. They want to do things the way they want to do it, and they don't want to listen to what anybody else says, and we're living in this very sort of democratic society, if you will, or wild democracy where it's just an article of our American faith. Nobody ought to tell me what to do. And I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. Well, that's why we're in the political mess that we're in, because we can't agree on what ought to happen. And it's why churches are in the mess that they're in, because we can't accept common oversight. And sometimes churches that could have elders don't have elders because guys that are qualified, man, they don't want to serve. They have no desire. Why would you want to serve when that just makes you a target for every every critical brother or sister in the congregation. I've known guys that actually have said that. I, you know, they're qualified to serve, but they don't want to serve because it just, just puts them in an untenable position. Now, maybe they need to change their attitude, or maybe everybody else needs to change their attitude and say, if you'll serve as an elder with other elders, then, then we'll agree to follow the decisions that, uh, that you make as, as an eldership. So anyway, as I said, don't get me started on that. All right. Um, we've been at this an hour and 35 minutes now. Who's got questions or comments? Or who uh, wants to go to lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that too, uh, not long ago, we, I think it was in one of our winter lectureships, uh, one of the assigned topics was, uh, and maybe Diesel Camp was the one that uh, dealt with it, was the possibility of a new apostasy. Yeah. He said, well, I disagree with, the, with even with the title of this because it's not a new apostasy. It's the same thing. Yes, same thing, thing over and over again. Ever yeah. since the first century church. Yes. You know, we fall away uh, from the divine pattern. Yeah. Uh, that's just all that it is. And that's, that's all Paul said in, in Acts 20 when he met with the elders. It's going to come within you, yeah. uh, and you're going to lead them away. And uh, we just have so many churches today, and you mentioned a moment ago about these little bitty churches that are springing up all. Well, the reason why so many little bitty churches are springing up is because brethren are not working out their differences as the Lord said they yeah. should. Yeah. Uh, they just rather, I'll go over here, and I'll take my football <laughs> and, yes. and go home, so to speak. And we're going to go over here. Uh, and we're not going to have anything to do with you anymore. And so now you got two little churches that not only do not have an eldership, but they don't even have enough financial wherewithal yeah. to have a located preacher. They don't have enough members even to conduct their own services. That's I mean, we're, I'm not going to name names, but we got a situation over on the other side of the line with two churches that are probably 20, maybe 25 miles apart. But they both, it's not that they sprang up, Bill. It's that these were once functioning congregations that were fairly strong, and now they have, they've not evangelized, they've squabbled among themselves, and they've shrunk to where they don't have enough guys to support them, and so they're asking at Downers Grove, send us men over here. Well, okay, we've got some guys that are happy to go out and preach, but they're already doing that for a lot of these little congregations, and they, if, if they're gone more than two Sundays a month, how, how are they really members at Downers Grove? And some of them, it's almost like you have an obligation to send your men over here to help us when we, you know, we've been this way for years and we can't even mind our own business now. So, and, and I've been saying to some of them, why don't you think about at least talking with people and this, I can't tell you what to do. It's not my business. I don't want to violate autonomy, but common sense would seem to me to say, you, you folks need to be talking to each other about, you know, merging or coming together, doing something so that you'd have at least one viable congregation that might still not have elders, but at least you'd have enough people to continue to operate as a congregation for people in that general geographic area. So, um, and, you know, and you, that's another can of worms that you get into. People say, well, um, you know, you, you get, get this congregation that has elders and has, you know, enough young people to have Bible classes and people will leave the smaller congregations and come there because they want their kids to be in a Bible class. They want their kids to associate with other Christians. Well, I can see kind of both sides of that. I mean, I understand why a family would want to do that. I also understand that it weakens the congregation and makes them smaller. But the question is, 
why doesn't that smaller congregation have enough people? Why haven't they evangelized? Why haven't they converted enough people in that area to be able to have these Bible classes? So I've probably said enough there to offend nearly everybody. So you may have questions or comments. Um, Ray, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> and then she... I think in most cases like that, the brethren find a way to work around that. Just, you know, Christians meet here or Church of God or something. And most of the time, uh, in areas, at least where I've worked overseas, China, for example, you can't put out a sign that says anything. I mean, it's still very much an underground church, and it operates by word of mouth. So the kind of concerns that we have here about having a building and putting a sign out is not really a, a concern. So I, I don't know the answer to everything, and I know brethren have sometimes done exactly what you said, but generally uh, somebody who wants to follow God is going to find a way to meet with other Christians uh, regardless of what the government says or regardless of what somebody with a denominational mentality says, you know, that supposedly controls the, the title, if you will. Um, but that, that's a good, a good point that uh, grows out of this denominational mentality that we've been talking about. Yeah. There, there are several descriptors, if you will. They're not even really, I think we use them as a title. We have lapsed into an almost denominational uh, mentality. Uh, on the other hand, I know some, some people that are kind of embarrassed by using the name Church of Christ. They don't, they don't want to use that because they're kind of ashamed of it, it seems to me. So they're kind of two extremes in this regard. Um, you had your hand up a minute ago. I didn't, uh, didn't mean to keep you waiting. Well, that's right. I, uh, I put on my thread something I've said. I've, I've helped a lot of young men, more than 100, uh, in my lifetime who said, I want to prepare myself to preach, either as a mentor in an intern situation or in, in classes like we had at Danville or Expressway in Louisville. Uh, but I've only had one young man, one, who came and said, I don't, he said, I don't think I'll ever preach. But he said, I would like to be an elder one day, and I need to start preparing myself to be an elder. He was about 30 at the time. Now, why don't we have more men who look on it as I have to prepare myself? And yes, churches ought to have classes. They ought to, but, but men have to take the responsibility of saying, if I'm going to serve as an elder, I need to start preparing. I need to know more about the Bible. I need to know more about other things. Gene? Yes. An eldership, and so they, it's, they're being asked to prepare for something they've never, never seen. seen. Yeah. And in some cases, they're from single parent family. They don't even have, have a good model of what a father looks like. 
so they can't raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord unless they learn how to do that. So yes, churches have an obligation to help and enable young men who want to do that. Uh, I'm really pleased that at Downers we have two of our deacons who have, I don't know if they do this every Friday, but they meet pretty regularly with each other to kind of be, you know, what, you know, what can we do to, to prepare ourselves to be an elder? And I've asked elders in a lot of congregations, who are the elders going to be here in 20 years? I mean, a church that has elders even. 20 years, when you guys are gone, you're, not, you're, not, you're in the ground, who will the elders be? Who's, being tra who's in the pipeline? Who, who are deacons who might be groomed and trained and, and interned and mentored uh, to, to show them, to teach them what it's like to be an elder? Um, how many times have you invited young men or deacons into, the, into an elders meeting? I don't mean when there's something confidential going on or something that, you know, is heavy duty, but I mean just to see what elders do. I mean, I grew up listening to dinner table conversation with my dad and my granddad that sometimes talked about elder business. Again, not confidential things, but what kind of decisions. Most of the congregations I worked with before I became an elder, I, I served as an elder for 10 years, um, I would sit in on their conversations. Usually the only time I left the room was when they were talking about my, my income, my pay, my support, my wages as a preacher. Um, but I can tell you this, it's a whole lot different sitting and watching a decision being made and actually having to pull the trigger yourself. You have to be a part of that process. You have to say, gentlemen, I think we need to do this, and here's why I think we need to do that, and then either persuade others that this is the way we ought to go or be persuaded if somebody else says, well, I think there's a better way to do that, and here's why I think that, and you think, well, okay, yeah, your idea is better than my idea. Let's do that. But it's, it's different when you have to be the one that's in the decision-making process and actually pull the trigger on something than when you're just watching it happen. So uh, all of these things, I think, need to happen if we're going to get over this hurdle of far too many congregations that are rudderless and elderless and they don't have direction and they're just floundering uh, because they, they're a sheep without a shepherd. I mean, literally. Um, Christ intended for his churches to have shepherds under the chief shepherd, Peter says, who himself was an elder as well as an evangelist uh, and an apostle for that matter. So... It's just a problem that we have not addressed that has got to be addressed, and it's a thorny problem that I, I, don't, I don't know all the answers to it, but we've we got to do something. I, I challenge the, the congregation here. Uh, do the members of the congregation here know of any of the men of the congregation who sometimes at least desire and sometimes yeah. serve? And if you don't even know who has that aspiration, how can we support and challenge them and help them to grow? And do you know of any of the young men? I mean, yeah. when I say young men, I'm talking about teenagers. Because we, we can't wait till somebody's 30 years old. Yeah. They might have messed well, up that's, royal. That's right. And, and, uh, you know, and fortunately, we've got two young men. They're both down at Florida College now, Jerry Greer and Nathan Beaufay. Their parents have already talked to them about uh, their desire for yeah. the future, for yeah. the eldership. Uh, and if parents would, if parents would do their job in that regard, yeah, absolutely. And if the local church would do their job in that regard, as far as knowing who has a desire to be an elder, and then start helping them uh, qualify themselves. And uh, we had uh, Robert Spear several years ago hold uh, our two uh, before Thursday lectures two, two months in a row concerning the eldership and he made a very good point that many times churches when somebody is announced uh, you got two or three men that are announced that have a desire to be an elder uh, so we need to you know uh, decide whether or not churches go about it as, as a way of disqualifying them rather than qualifying them. And I think yeah. that he made a good point there yeah. uh, in that regard. And there, so there's just a whole lot of reasons why we don't have the elders. Yeah. And, and even with somebody's 30 or 40, I mean, it's not too late necessarily. They, they can, you know, you've got 20 years, 10 years, 15 years before you would get to, to an age where you clearly have believing children and so forth, which is a, a huge impediment. A lot of men 
have not raised their family that way. And in, in my opinion, if you're going to appoint somebody, you ought to have a way or take, find a way to, you know, to ask this guy's wife and children, you know, is he the kind of person at home that would make a good elder? And if that doesn't come back as a resounding endorsement, then you need to run away. And I think the other part of the equation is we sometimes look at this fairly narrow list of qualifications or disqualifications, as sometimes brethren make it. But there are other texts that give us information about what does an elder do? What is the work of a shepherd and overseer? There are three words that are used to describe this guy. One has to do with shepherding. One has to do with kind of administrative ability. I mean, a guy who can't organize a two-car parade, uh, you <laughs> You do not want him serving as an elder. And then somebody that has enough age and experience, some road miles on them, if you will, to have studied the Bible. They're not a novice. All three of those things come into play. But I've used the analogy of, of want ads before. If you read the want ads in a paper or online, usually you get two things. You'll get a list of minimum requirements. It has to have a high school diploma or maybe a college degree or a CDL or some other license or certification. Those are entry-level qualifications based on past history that shows that here are some minimum requirements. Without these, he do, you don't even look at it. The application goes in the round file or goes in the shredder because he doesn't meet the qualifications. But then you get, here's what the job requires, here's what he must do. He must, in the secular jobs, he might say, uh, must work well with people, must be willing to travel, must be able to use certain kinds of equipment or be familiar with this computer program or that or something else, uh, or have some degree of experience might be a part of the requirement. So that's kind of how I look at the scripture. We tend to focus on this minimum requirement list without asking the really central question, can this man do the work of an elder, a shepherd, a pastor, an overseer? Uh, does he have that qualification to be sure? But then can he do the work? And uh, frankly, I've known guys that if you went down the checklist, they could kind of technically meet all of those qualifications, but you sit back and say, man, this guy would be a disaster as an elder. Uh, because even though he might meet all of the technical qualifications, he really is not suited to do the work. And uh, that's sort of the kind of decision that we make even sometimes in the political arena. You know, this guy may have experience. He may have been in the Senate or he may have been a governor or he may have served in the military. He may have all these requirements. He may be a legislator or whatever. But do you really, do you really want him as president or do you really want him representing you in the Senate? I mean, even though he technically meets some qualifications, you know, he's 35 or older and he's a United States citizen and all the things in the Constitution. But, man, I... Do you want this guy as president? I don't think so. Um, and we kind of have to do the same thing with elders. Sure, they meet, need to meet these qualifications. You don't want somebody who's a novice. You don't want somebody who, who can't convict the gainsayer. You don't want somebody who's not hospitable. But the question is, can he do the job? Can he do the work of an evangelist? Seems to me there are a lot of passages that talk about that besides just the qualification passages. I think we need right. to ask concerning that uh, the point that you're making here, uh, to ask, do I want this man watching after my soul? Yes, absolutely. And my children's souls. Are, help yeah. me get to That's exactly right. That's you know, a, if, he's not, if he's not going to pay enough attention to know that I'm starting to drift yeah. and come to me immediately and, and say, listen, we need to, whatever we need to do, yeah. study or whatever, but you're starting to get off the, the right path yep. here. Uh, we need to be sure that whomever we are putting in the eldership, yeah. those men are going to be uh, the men who are going to take very careful care of our souls. I, I think that's where the, the desire enters in in some ways. I mean, it's not like you're, you want to have a, a title behind your name or you want another line on your resume, say, well, I'm an elder in the church. Let me tell you, if you're going to serve as an elder, it is a frustrating, thankless, time-consuming job. It is a black hole on your time. I cannot tell you how many sleepless nights, late night phone calls, conversations, trying to work with people that don't want to be worked with. You will have a target on your back. So if you don't desire, if you don't want to do that, 
you are not going to last in that job, and you will not do a good job while you're, while you're in that particular office, if you will. So you have to have the desire to want to serve God's people, or, or you, you're going to burn out, I guarantee you, because it, I cannot think of a more thankless job than to try to shepherd a bunch of people who many of them don't want to be shepherded. I mean, it's like the old phrase, herding cats. <laughs> Cattle, cattle you can herd, cats you can't. Um, so. I've asked you to Mark Russell two or three times if he would go and present for us in our fourth Thursday lecture. And he has responded, Bill, ever since I was appointed an elder, I just did not have the time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but, like I said, I'd love to, but I feel a greater responsibility to yeah. my you know, being an elder and yeah. taking care of that. And I fully appreciate it. I, uh, uh, the best I can tell, depending, you know, looking at what elders are responsible for, I don't know how they ever find time to do it all. Yeah. I, the, the decade that I served as an elder, I cut out n nearly all of my overseas travel. I cut way back on my meetings because I just could not be away from the work. And uh, I felt like at that point I, the congregation needed needed me to serve as an elder. I mean, you know, when you get down close to where um, a heart attack or a transfer dissolves the eldership, um, you, you just don't need to go there. And so, but I can tell you, it, it is just an unbelievable responsibility and you are setting yourself up almost to fail in some ways because you're working with people that are in rebellion against God in a lot of cases. I mean, there are a lot of good brethren too that will support you, don't get me wrong. Um, but but it's it's an almost impossible task and it's a thankless job. So, all right, we're down to seven minutes before. I think that's probably a good place to quit. I appreciate your your input. I, I Bill, I could probably do at least one more lesson that gets us into this whole last twenty or thirty years uh, kind of thing. If you if you want to do that, or if you just if you get. <laughs> Well, you know, I said, wind me, wind me up for as long as you want me to go, and I'll, I'll go that long. But uh, so, yeah, if you if you get a, a Thursday that you don't have anybody else to speak, I'll I'll come and speak for you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I better unhitch myself here. Because I tell you, Steve, if I don't get you lined up, Brendan is going to ask for somebody else to come and preach here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, do you still, well, you can get my, my little uh, drive with it. I think it's still in the machine. Oh, yeah, I'll get that for you. All right. Thank you all for your... I, I think that uh, it's quite obvious why um, we have asked Steve to come and speak for us and why we enjoy it so very much. It's not only so very informative, but he makes it uh, very enjoyable for us to listen to, very easy uh, to listen to. Here's some better news for you. He's holding our fall meeting, so uh, you know uh, we're uh, we've got him lined up for quite a bit of uh, coming over to be. With. I think that if we get him much more, he's going to have to place membership over here because <laughs> and just lead down his grown. You need to set a date for that. Yeah. Yes, we do. Um, but we'll work on that. Uh, but we do so much appreciate not only uh, Steve's scholarship and his expertise in the subject matter but just uh, just appreciate uh, him as uh, a child of God who is so fervent in his service to the Lord and I certainly am very proud that uh, I could call him my brother in Christ and uh, enjoy that very much um, so uh, everybody by now surely is ready for lunch uh, and whatever we will gather over at the wheel um, on Indianapolis for any who don't know where that is. The only new one among us is Jean, and she I think she knows where the wheel is uh, and whatever has been there. So we will gather over there in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, minutes. Uh, Ray, you're visiting with us again. Thank you so very much for making the 80-mile journey over here in the rain. I'm uh, going to ask you to word our closing prayer, and if you would, just go ahead and... Uh, ask the, the God's blessing on our, the food that we're going to have at lunchtime so it's so much easier for us to hear it here in, in the building.
Let us pray. Dear Lord God in heaven, we come humbly before you, Lord, thanking you for this day, for this opportunity that you've given us again to hear another portion of your word. Lord, help us to always to, to consider what others have gone through and what others have sacrificed, but to always look to your son as our example. Help us, Lord, to try to follow that example, to learn lessons that have been learned in the past so that we don't have to make the same mistakes. Lord, we thank you for Brother Steve Wolfgang's knowledge and his desire and ability to share that knowledge. We thank you for the brethren here in Hammond and, and the light that they shine in this community. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you give us, material and spiritual. We ask, Lord, that you be with each one of us as we go our separate ways. And for those of us who are going to... to eat together. Lord, we ask that you bless that food, that it might be nourishment to our bodies. Help us, Lord, to consider the spiritual food that we always need, to have that desire for the spiritual food also. We ask, Lord, that you help us to consider those that have less than us and how we might help them. Please forgive us our sins, Lord, as we travel each one our separate ways. That you be with us, that we may return safely in your son's holy name.